Welcome to Earful of Dirt Lineouts Extra, our rugby technique series, which with Gordon Hanlon. Today's episode is something he's been been beating me up about for a long time now. He's like, "When are we going to do the scrum episode?" And I was like, "Well, I got to get like the people lined up." Well, we'll have the people lined up first, though. Let's get our technical knowledge on the overall idea of what scrum is and then we'll look we're gonna get into some styles with some other coaches along the line but gordon how are you today uh i'm good i'm good you didn't uh make an attempt to pronounce the club name uh okay okay here we go here we go tsv hanjashai that's getting better there, there we go really good actually that was probably the best of the group yeah i had to talk about scrums um I absolutely love scrums. Uh, I know I'm. Well, you know, I was like, you were a fly half, and you were like, oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. no, I played flanker, and I was a prop. Uh, I was, I was like, a prop. Yeah. So when I was a sco in school, I went to Belvedere, and I was, um, put it in American terms, uh, like 220 plus when I was like 15, 16. And so I played prop all, all, all my young life and i really really enjoy it but scrums are something that i love because it's probably the only point in the entire game of rugby where a large group of people actually have to work together versus another large group you know an individual piece of brilliance isn't going to settle a scrum um there's not many other sports like well i guess rowing when you have your your eight man they have to work together in unison and, and that that's why like regardless of where i've coached in new zealand portugal or whatever, america if i'm coaching backs we, if we get a penalty against the head or we win a scrum against the head uh, you'll hear me just screaming in delight because i absolutely love it I, I cannot express just how much i love it it's it's it's, it's the most technical aspect of all of all of the game it's the aspect that requires the most amount of work it's the aspect that requires the uh, biggest or most attention to detail and it's also the most overlooked aspect in the entire game of rugby at the moment um and i think it's like i, I do cherish them and it'd be a sad day if they take the scrumming out out of the game that's what i believe um well that's rugby league yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so <sighs> Let's talk about the purpose of and define the scrum. Okay. Well, uh, very simply, the scrum is a way of uh, restarting play, just like a line out, just like a kickoff. And there are some, maybe some free kicks and stuff. But yeah, that, it, it, it is the, just a way of restarting play. The purpose is it can be different depending on your principles or what you want out of the game you know some people will use scrums uh, let's say in england to to win penalties others want to use it as a platform to launch attacks and score tries others want to use it as a way of like tiring out their their opposition um so your your the purpose is really dependent on um who you are what your team principles are and, and what you want. So, so that digs a little bit into the purpose and yep. cause it's being different, but what is, I guess, to the lay person, what is the scrum in general? Uh, okay. It is, um, Usually you'll have uh, eight, eight versus eight. The, the three guys at the front are generally the three smartest on the team. All props will tell you that. Um, so you've got eight on eight. Uh, you guys come together, the ball goes in, and, and then you play from that. It is, though, I believe it is the single best attacking platform that there is in, in rugby because it, it you have your eight forwards and you also have the number nine. You have the most amount of concentrated players in such a small space and um you get to you know you get to restart play but you also have these huge attacking opportunities which i think teams sometimes that the purpose is lost in that yeah. 
um, like uh, the best way I've had it described to me. So I, I was very fortunate um, to be able to watch a lot of rugby with uh, one of the best coaches in the world in um, Mike Cron. And one time we were watching the Hurricanes play the Haguares. And, and again, we talked about different styles. So the Argentinians scrum very differently than the New Zealanders who scrum differently than the French. And, and, and I asked him about, well, why do these, what, why, what is this differences? And his answer was very simple. It's, you know, not everyone likes steak. So, <laughs> you know, if you go to a restaurant, you know, there's, there's many different things in the menu. Some people believe fish to be better. Some people prefer uh, vegetarian or vegan meals. Some like uh, chicken. But there's, there should always be, there's always steak there. And steak was what, what he believes to be the best way. And, and it's kind of like our, our philosophies align quite closely on that. Um, and yeah, we could. We don't think we won't get into this too deeply. That that, that can be for so other experts. So, what's your version of steak? Uh, it is um, it's top quality ball. As I said, it is the the best attacking platform with the most amount of defenders in a concentrated area. So it gives you the most amount of space on the field. So top quality ball is is, is what you want your scrum to be. Um, and just just for example, I, I just I pulled up some numbers. Um, if you look at the uh, the All Blacks in 2016 and 17, right, they scored three times more tries from scrums than all the other rugby championship teams combined. Um, if you look at the World Cup in 2015, like take for example, the great example is, um, I don't know if you remember the New Zealand France game. So France had, I think, eight or nine scrums, and they won 100% of their scrums, but they had 0% top quality ball. So if you don't have top quality ball, you can't launch attacking platforms. Whereas the All Blacks average like 95% win ratio, but 90% of their scrums are top quality ball. Um, and to bring it back to like so, so my team here this year, um, we in games that we won, the opponent had 5% top quality ball all game in the set piece. In games that we lost, that number was 28%. And, and the reason that's important, I bring it up, is because we're actually very close to, um, like MLR sides are closer to us than they are the All Blacks. And I think that's a fair assumption. Um, and it's important because we have a, a new backline, there's some younger players. It's the first year coming together. Our, um, our defensive transitions need a lot of work. You know, you'll, you'll notice that, that some of the line breaks that they made in the MLR could be, are, are line breaks that you wouldn't see um, at international rugby. Not because of the quality of, of athlete, it's just because it's, it's the first year and, and experience uh, hasn't got there yet. You know, we are a four dominated team, like, like a Seattle type thing. So that means that in order for us to defend how we like, like we talked about in our defense one, we have to have a platform set and we have to be able to apply pressure. But if, we are giving teams the opportunity to launch easy attacks against our backline. It puts the entire team under pressure. So by disrupting the scrum as much as possible and not giving them this top quality ball to launch their attacks from, it enables us to defend and to generate turnovers and generate slow ball an awful lot, uh, an awful lot better. And we generally, as I said, we generally win games uh, when, we can, when we can do that. So, you know, how do you generate power to do this? Um, for the, okay. Um, let's, before we get to the power, I, I probably should have defined what, what top quality ball is. My, my wife is pointing at me. Uh, I've been talking about it for five minutes and we haven't defined it. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> so yeah. let's define top quality. Yeah. So, um, to put it in a, an easy context, uh, I'll use a line out, for example. So if you jump and catch the line out at the front, the number nine has a really long pass to make. So the defense will generally have the advantage. If you jump to a throw and jump at the very back and the number nine catches it, the pass is a lot flatter and it's a lot quicker and you're able to launch attacks. That's it in a line out point of view. In scrums, it is um, 
you want the ball after your engagement and when, the, and when the ball is put in you want the ball played from the back of the scrum within three seconds so if you can do it within three seconds generally people will will stay attached and push on a scrum for four maybe five seconds so if you can do it within three you'll generally have a second or a second and a half advantage over the flankers and the number eight which gives you a lot more space um, depending on which side of the field you are. So if you're on the right-hand side of the field, you'd want to play channel one ball, which is where it comes in and just to the left-hand side. You'll also, if you're on the left, you want channel two or channel three. The scrum has to be stable. Like there's no point in getting a really dominant push. The uh, scrum half puts the ball in, the ball is back, and right as he goes to passes, it, it, it moves left or right, and then he has to check his pass. That's not top quality ball. You can't launch an attack off that properly. Um, if you are, again, if you're on the left-hand side, you want the tight head to be dominant, so the scrum kind of twists to the right. It twists to the right, it moves their flankers away from the ball. So you always want to kind of have the base of the scrum facing where you want to go and the ball in and out uh, as quickly as possible. So you have that space to attack. You know, if it, it doesn't just have to be passing, like the number eight can pick and run. However, if the number eight picks, runs and gets tackled, well, that's pretty shit because the, the point of contact is set just where the scrum is. So you have to get a pass away. You have to have some movement and you have to get the ball away from, from, from where the eight started um so to sum it up it has to be stable there has to be clean ball at the feet and it has to be in and out within three seconds um and to come back to your, your question about power it it all comes from by articular force which is like where you generate the most amount of power in the ground okay and then you know so power into yeah. the ground by articular force what's yeah. that um well it's 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 not really so we have two types of muscles in our body and this is more of a biomechanical thing so there's monoarticular muscles which is where it's one muscle goes over one joint. And then you have biarticular muscles, whereas where the muscle goes over two joints. So your hamstrings, for example, are connected to, to two joints. It's your knee and your hip. Um, and it's, it's a very simple ratio. It, 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 it's, how can I do a test? Yeah, so if you look at, we'll just use your ex, uh, arm, for example. So if your arm, not, not your bad arm, use your good one. <laughs> you <know? laughs> if, if you hold the arm straight out completely, you have the most amount of flexibility in your shoulder. Like you have the biggest range of motion, but you're not that strong. Now, if you were to clench your fist, hold your arm in tight, clench your bicep, tighten your tricep, everything, there's not that much range of motion in your shoulder, but it's an awful lot stronger. So generating power comes out of these biarticular muscles and you want to have the most amount of flexibility combined with the biggest strength to be able to make force. And it's basically, it's a 50-50 is the ratio. So on our body, that looks like a 45 degree angle. So if you have uh, your arm out, so you, you extend your shoulder, but you bend at the elbow 45 degrees. Now you have a lot more range of motion in your shoulder, but consider your biceps, your triceps, uh, and then behind that are, are a lot tighter and that's that's the biomechanics lesson for today um <laughs> but so it's how does that look like in a scrum though which is important um and the best way to do it is you look at the two points of contact and the two points of contact in the scrum are we'll just use props for example is shoulders uh, contact against the opposition and then your feet in the ground so you want to kind of try to remain or keep that 45 degree angle and so what that looks like on, on, in, in a scrum form is if you get a stick or you just take a if you go watch a game I did some work on earlier if you watch a game and you pause it on the scrum and draw a line 
like you know the way on like Instagram and stuff, you can put two dots and draw a line between it. You draw a line from the point of contact at the shoulder and the point of contact at the feet. And that line should go through the knees. So if the, the kneecap or the knees is below that line, that means your your hips are down and your shoulders are up, and then the power is going, you're going to be not as strong and power is going to go upwards, but it means you're also very susceptible to going backwards. If your um, your knees are higher than this line, then you cannot generate as much power. So imagine kind of just standing straight up and bending over, keeping your legs straight and then trying to push. You, you, you're not going to do anything. So you always want to try and have this line. Uh, and that's what it's called by articular force. That's what, um, it's difficult because everyone's line is different. You know, I'm, I'm short, but like Brody Retallick is six foot nine, or I think he's six nine or six eight. His, his angles are going to be different. So I know like back in the day, they used to say, oh, you have to have 90 here, 120 here, which for different types of scrumming, that is correct. However, when you're trying to generate the most amount of power in the shortest space, shortest amount of time possible to win the scrum as quickly as possible, you need to be in the strongest pushing position. So that's where you have to get into your head. You have, the girls have to understand what the strongest pushing position is. And from a biomechanical point of view, it is a straight line going from your shoulders to your feet, which intersects your knee. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So what are the key points of the scrum? Um, Did I lose you? I think I lost Gordon, everyone. And scrums for different situations. You know, I don't really, too often we get in and we say, hey, we're just going to scrum. We're going to scrum. We're going to scrum. Well, it, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, so you have your setup for your system. You have the actions, the actions on bind, the actions on set, the actions after the engagement. You have the uh, after the scrum is over. But if we start with just the, the system, right? Every, every forward and the number nine, first key thing is has to know what type of scrum you want. Do you want the tight head up? Do you want the loose head up? Is it five meters from our line? Are we just going to try hit and hold and push them out? Or what are we going to try and do? So everyone has to be clear on the different scrums that you want. And, and you know, uh, unless you practice it, you, it's not going to work. You might as well stick with just your, your one. Let's just hit and smash and go from there. Um, but for example, the setup. So your props, you want to have their outside outside legs up. The hooker will want to have his right foot or her right foot up, and 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 their binding, the tension in their bind should keep them together. The second rows is uh, again in a biomechanical sense, we are much stronger across the chests when we do like a like a butterfly action so when we when we're moving in the same angles we're a lot stronger so so like this grip here where i can hold my hands together and my arms are in a circle is a lot stronger than if i have one arm up and the other sideways like that and what that looks like in the scrum sense is you know back in the day you used to see the french where they they bind so they have their right hand bound around the second row and then their left arm is through the, the props legs and they'll take an under underbind on the shorts. You see that. So so that means that their their body isn't actually working together. So they're they're working on two different angles or two different planes. So for second rows, what they need to do is their bind has to be isometric. They have to try and get in and their arm up underneath the leg at an angle, and then their other arm needs to be on the same kind of angle. Um, and then you have when they, they can either be standing and engage in the scrums, which I think is better, or the majority of most teams will be kneeling. Um, and the reason why I think the standing up is better is because you can 
you get more tension through your core, through your glutes. Um, it's more difficult to hold, but you can get into the scrum in a much stronger position and there's less movement, which will loosen the binds as opposed to starting on your knees and then getting going up from that. Um, and the whole focus is, and then for flankers and stuff, flankers are bound, they're generally on their knees, they'll use one hand for support, um, but they have to be square. So too often uh, you'll see flankers and their legs are split and that's okay to start with, but then they're not square. They're pushing in, they're pushing out and they're changing the, the direction of force, which is going through the props, which causes a huge uh, decrease in power. And the number eight will have a split stance and number eight will get his bind and his tension from pulling the two second rows uh, closer towards him. And that's your basic setup in your system. It's, um, it's, very simple, but very nuanced and very complex to get all of these little pieces right. Because if one one person is wrong, then the whole thing will, will go. So for example, like a scrum generates 1.5 tons of pressure at the international level. Okay. And like if a, if a flanker is sent, or sent off, <laughs> or sorry, not attached to the scrum, um, you lose between 400 and 600 pounds of pressure. So it's, it's absolutely huge. Um, so to go from that, I guess I should talk about the actions, like the binding, and just a couple of things for me anyway, the, the, the binding, what's most important is on, when the ref says bind is for all eight um, to breathe as one. So all eight is to take a huge breath in. So that will expand the lungs, expand the chest, the, the backs will get bigger, and then the spaces will get a lot tighter and narrower. Um, they tighten the gaps, you've got tension through your entire body. And again, you're focused on, as a guy, Captain Dallas, you say, promote your chest. So you're focused on your chest thing out. Like, yeah, if you imagine if you have that, you're walking like that, and then you have the stick between your elbows as the back, you want to promote your chest. <laughs> Put your, just imagine your name on your chest, like it says Bradley or whatever. <laughs> um, and then it, it just shows the difference. You can see someone that has switched on before Scrum versus someone that's not in the props. Um, like how many, if you're watching the national games, you look at the props, and especially the loose head, their, their left arms are generally always locked and loaded. It looks like they're ready to punch them. And so on the bind, they, they make sure to try and get that dominant um, grip. Whereas other props who are not that focused, their arms will be down. They might be resting their forearm on their knee. So you do that and now all of a sudden your shoulder is softer, it's weaker, your back is more of an angle, um, and then you have to get straight before you can engage. So you always want to be have the tension and, and that's really where the, where the, the, the scrums are won and lost. It, it, it's, it's being ready and being acting as one before the actual engagement. So when you hear the set call, the, the hooker and the number eight uh, will be the trigger. They'll put their foot back and then we engage. So if you're on, if the second rows are, um, have a split stance, they'll get their feet square. Uh, the flankers will also get their feet square. The props will have to really focus on being tight and on engaging. But like if you look at, uh, just if you're lifting weights, you know, so on bind, we've all, we've all taken a big breath in. And then on set, we all breathe out with force and then we hit with force. And when we do that as one, we're generally guaranteed to win the impact um, because other teams get lazy. And, and, and it's the simple things. You do that, you're, you're, you generate more force. And that's all, that's what I believe scrumming is about. Um, and then if you can win the collision, although the collisions aren't as big as the older days, I'm sure Grant will chime in about how back in his time, it used to be all about the collision. Um, you win that collision, you're in a much better place because you have the ability to engage on two different planes of force. So there's two ways we engage. One is we you go across and then you try to come down, which means you'll generally win the space but the other team might be underneath you or we'll try and sink and then go across. And if they get the jump on you, then we'll be um, scrunched up and not in a position, not in a yeah, position to be able to generate force. So on the first one, our knees will be higher than that particular force line. And on the second one, our knees will be much, much lower. So we want to engage downwards. 
Um, and we do that because one, it's quicker to get into the scrum position if we're going downwards, but also it applies pressure to the opposite front row on two different planes. Um, so now they have different forces and they have to react to different forces. They might react to just one of them and then you have a huge advantage. Um, and that's, that's what you want to do there. Um, the engagement or after the engagement, it, it's, you know, back in the day, it used to be about a lot of footwork. Um, take big steps, get nice and strong. Like I, I worked with a prop here who every engagement, really strong guy, really strong. Every engagement though, when he felt pressure, he took his left foot, he was a loose head and he moved it out to the left because it was easier, it was more comfortable for him. Um, but he didn't realize like his whole body was straight and then his left leg is at like a 30 degree angle. You can't generate uh, forward momentum like that. Um, so now it's about smaller steps and the referees will give time to wait for the scrum to be stable. So you want to have smaller, quicker steps. You're always trying to be in, in contact with the ground because that's where your force comes from. Um, and always be thinking this biarticular line, what is strong, what is strong, and to get into that strong position. Um, and it's kind of, the way I describe it is, you want to like figuratively you know, like walk towards the pressure instead of running away from it. Because the more pressure you're under, the opposition is also under pressure. And if you move yourself into a position where you're more comfortable, that means less pressure is coming off or is going on. And then the scrum is not going to be as effective. So, so scrums aren't meant to be comfortable, especially if you're in the front row, you know, this is, you're not trying out an air foam mattress. <laughs> it's, it's, it's meant to be uncomfortable and you have to embrace that and you have to walk towards it and you have to constantly put yourself in the most uncomfortable position if it is the strongest position or the pushing position. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. And then, um, so we've talked, you know, setting, mm -hmm. and then we've talked engagement. We've talked yep. hit and chase. Now let's, uh, I guess, round this out with, uh, you know, I guess the two most important people in the scrum, a hooker <laughs> and a yeah. nine. <laughs> Uh, I think these maybe, days it's, maybe it's, it's, maybe the nine's not that important. But no, no, um, I think these days more it's the uh, most important is the ref than the nine. <laughs> um, so again, I talked about channels earlier. So if it's a channel one ball, you want it to go in and out quickly. Channel one will be um, the hooker will have <clears throat> their their hooking leg over uh, already out in position. It'll generally be underneath the loose head prop. You'll see this in a majority of games. The ball comes in and it's gone. Um, it's hooked quickly, and the number eight or the number nine will play it from the left-hand side of the channel. The way the laws are, and in that they changed last year, that the number nine doesn't have to be um, in the middle. He just has to be square. So uh, I feed the ball like this. No, as long as the ball goes in square, if you can put the ball in as close to the middle of the scrum as possible, the better the chance you have of getting quick ball. So if you can put the ball in where the hooker doesn't even have to hook, that's, that's ideal. The ball comes back and you win it because you can also reach into the scrum and take the ball out now. Um, or if it, it does, if it's gonna be channel two or channel three, it needs some direction on, on, the, on the ball. So then the hooker will have to hook it, but he's generally in a square position. He's generally trying to drive forward and he, they will just direct the ball um, straight back or to the right. Um, and, and, and that's it, that's the basis of the scrum. It, it's very much, the laws are changing all of the time. So it's getting quicker and quicker. And I feel that like to aim for top quality ball has to be the key. And I, I think we did some numbers, but maybe I can, I'll find them and I'll send them through. We, we looked at the MLR and, 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 and top quality ball statistics and it's, the teams that can do this will, will win. Um, the teams that can launch their backs in a quicker way will win. They will get, they'll make more meters. They'll, they'll get over the advantage line better. Um, and then if you can disrupt that, you're going to help your defense massively. Um, I guess I should 
fully round out. I should have talked about um, the best way, just, just for anyone that's listening who wants to see what this line is, if you, if you use a, uh, an iPad or a smartphone, um, there's an app, a really, really brilliant app called Video Delay, which means um, basically press play and then you can set the delay. So if it's 30 seconds or a minute and then the camera runs behind time. Uh, so just set it up and just focus on what strong is and what, and what strong should look like on an individual basis is imagine if, you, if you're feet in the ground, you're on your knees and you got your hands directly underneath your shoulders and then you pop your hips up. And then just, just, just experiment and just look at yourself on video or get someone to video it or, or use a stick. If you have like an old uh, broom handle or something, you can just hold this up to from, from the point from the shoulder to the feet. And then just try and focus on what strong is. Um, and then going from that, like all the power comes from the ground. So it's not like a Stairmaster. You see some people trying to, and this is a problem that we have, you know, you get a little bit too excited, you're going forward with momentum and then everyone starts stepping and the cadence is off. And then the, the scrum becomes squirrely because one person is stronger than the other. And now all of a sudden you have messed up your top quality ball. So focus on, on, on feet in the ground, and a, again, for, by yourself, a good way of doing this is um, if you have like an ab roller, um, if you get the ab, actually. yeah, you, yeah, <laughs> you get, well, you just, again, you focus on being strong, you get the ab roller, you, you're on, but underneath your shoulders. And where people will cheat on this is, and again, you just want to, you want to extend your hips downwards and outwards at 45 degrees, then catch your feet up. Downwards and outwards at 45 degrees, catch your feet up. But what will happen is people will get, if they're not strong enough in the core, they will move their arms forward, shift the arm, the ab roller forward, and then go. So no, your arms has to stay um, completely square. And that's a good way to see if you are generating this bioticular force whilst moving forward. Awesome. So closing comments on just the the first bit of technical information that we're pushing out um from me or you well from you you're the <laughs> you're the technical coach here i'm just yeah, that, that uh, i'm hilarious. i'm i am in the midst of you know trying to educate myself and yeah. the people um the scrums is a thing if you change your mindset that's what it is you'll, you'll everyone will love it scrums are a thing to be appreciated and they are like if you like technical stuff look at the scrum if you like strength if you like teamwork if you like efficiency look at the scrum but just think of it i just what i believe anyway think of it as a way to score tries and the most fun aspect in rugby is scoring tries. Now, I'm sure some other coaches are going to come on and going to talk about how great it is when you win penalties and kick penalties and win World Cups and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not everyone has Johnny Wilkinson. But, um, yeah, so think about it as a way to, to, like, scoring tries, giving yourself the best attacking platform in the game, and proving yourself in a one-on-one -on -one match to be better prepared than the opposition. Because one, an individual piece of brilliance will not win you a scrum. It takes, uh, it takes a team to do that. And it's, it's really, I, I, I cannot speak uh, much more highly of it. <laughs> I absolutely love them. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Um, I think that'll round out this episode of Earful of Dirt's Lineouts Extra, our first edition of the Scrum. I think the next time Gordon and I get on, we'll we'll get even more technical, but uh, with it. But I think the our intent is to um, bring two North American scrummaging minds on. So I'll try to get the Houston. Uh, Sabercats head coach and former Ireland international prop, uh, Justin Fitzpatrick. And then we'll get 
a British and Irish Lion Welsh prop on Darren Morris. And then if I can even get cooler, maybe we'll get some Alex Corbazero action to talk scrummaging. So that will give you three different styles, English, Irish, and Welsh. And that, that'll be a great time. So I'm Aaron Castro for Ear Full of Dirt. Uh, thank you for coming on again, Gordon. Yeah, it's a pleasure as always.